The threat of uh, HIV has led to an enormous uh, um, uh, amount of uh, information on uh, virus infection in general and in particular on the uh, architecture of the HIV virus and of the various steps that it undergoes in living cells. There are several therapies that have been developed over the years against HIV. The problem with those therapies is that for every single therapy that was developed, the HIV became immune to that therapy. So that's why people have to go from one drug to another when they're infected with HIV. A virus that infects a cell contains at the core of it a genetic material that it tries to smuggle into the cell. And this genetic material is packaged in what is called a capsid. That capsid is a very strong container for this genetic material that protect it as long as the virus is outside of a cell. But once the virus enters the cell and has infected the cell, then the capsid has to be very quickly opening container on the other side. If you want to chemically attack the capsid uh, for medical reasons, then you need to know the full chemical detail of the capsid. And that was not available when the project started. So before that we knew it was a polymorphic structure. So we knew that two of them are going to be different. Then we knew the building blocks, so we knew that it was made of pentamers and hexamers. But all that information was known of isolated parts. We didn't have the whole structure together. In experiments, we have all like, different techniques that can look at the same thing at different size scales, and different resolutions. You can look at great detail, and you can look in uh, physiological conditions of the proteins but uh, you can only look at really small pieces of them. You cannot look at the whole assembly. Then the people who do electron microscopy, they can look at large assemblies at low resolution, but you cannot see what each atom is doing. So we have to find a way of putting all this together to build a capsid. We taught our computer program over many decades how to simulate the macromolecules of the living cell. And so now what the computer can do is it can try to take the pictures of the individual proteins that you see very clearly and match them into these fuzzy images of the proteins that appear with the electron microscope. So what we do is computational modeling. If you look at what we do, it might look like a, like a video game. Uh, but we, we actually, uh, what is going on there is real, is what you will see if you were able to look through a microscope at that scale. Essentially what we do is solve uh, Newton's equ equations of motion for the system. But we do this for several thousands of atoms and how they're interacting. And we solve this for several microseconds. Uh, the capsid is uh, made actually out of uh, over a thousand proteins. Altogether, we had to simulate a system of three billion atoms that made the envelope and in addition, all the liquid and salt ions, liquid molecules, water molecules, that gave us altogether 64 million atoms. And this was absolutely by far a simulation that was never done earlier. But we were very, very fortunate. Because right when this project was developing, the University of Illinois got delivery of the Blue Waters computer. So Blue Waters is larger, faster. I mean, it was essential to the success of the project because it's, a, it's the only machine where we could have run this simula the simulation this size. So now we had the, one of the fastest and largest computers in the world available. And we knew on this computer we could do simulate up to 100 million atom uh, systems. And so 64 million fit it actually snugly into the computer and so we could carry out the, the necessary simulation. And so we did. We simulated 64 million atoms uh, for, they took us a month. And I will not forget the day that he came running to me and said, Klaus, Klaus, look at it, look at it, how beautiful. And in fact, it was really like many important scientific results uh, are, 
uh, they are just initially and immediately beautiful and clear and so we got here a very lucky outcome of a very difficult computer simulation. And we could now look protein by protein how these over thousand proteins are capable of realizing a rather wide distribution of local shapes along the surface of the HIV capsid. And so that gave us for the first time the details of this astonishing uh, malleability of the capsid proteins. Some of our findings are actually key because you can do a single mutation and you render the virus inactive. That means uh, you know like very small details, you know what's going to happen at large scale. It also gave us first insights into how one might approach this capsid through pharmacological uh, warfare by developing now drugs that might fit into some of the nooks and crannies and thereby shut the capsid so that it couldn't release its genetic content when it was actually infecting a cell. The capsid is really attractive because it's essential to the survival of the virus, but also it's because, like in, in monkeys, monkeys are immune to HIV, and the way they're immune to HIV is by t attacking the capsid. They destroy the capsid once it gets into the cells. So the reason we have never developed drug against the HIV-1 capsid is because we didn't know what it looked like. So we essentially are uh, giving, or what we're giving to the world, this capsid that is the platform for the development of new therapies. And that's why it is so important.